and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors webinar series on the complexities of finding and employing individuals in China. Woodburn is proud to be hosting its first webinar series in 2019 on the HR issues that surround people and companies in China. Are you planning to recruit a team in China? Are you having turnover issues? Do you understand the new legal implications of hiring individuals in China? Together with Steinkellner China Search, a professional recruitment firm, we will provide you with information and tools on the HR issues which truly impact organizations that are not only new to the market, but that have been running for quite some time. This is day four of our webinar series. If you have missed the previous three days, the webinar recordings are already uh, uh, uploaded to Woodburn's YouTube page. Before we begin, I just want to go through a couple of administration points. Uh, the use of a VPN may be required, it may not be required. Yesterday I had the issue that my VPN was not required. Please do test that out to see which is a better option for you in order to have a stable internet line. Technical issues may always arise. This is kind of the disadvantage of doing online webinars. Please do stay on the line. We will always be able to come back within 30 seconds to one minute and continue with the presentation. Note that the presentation for today is being recorded and the PowerPoint presentation will be distributed to all the attendees and registrants uh, later on today. Now, once you've launched into the GoToWebinar system, you would have been prompted to choose your audio option. You, by default, would have been on your computer audio, uh, which would have said mic and speakers. If this is not functioning well for you, then do switch to a landline, and you will receive then a dial-in number, access code, and audio pin. We will be aiming to do about a 10-minute Q&A at the end of today's session. There is a lot of content to go through, um, but we will still try to do a between 5-10 minute Q&A. If you do have questions, please put them in the question section of the control panel. Um, if they're directed at me or if they're directed at Manfred, who will be the moderator for today, uh, we will answer them to you as soon as possible. Again, don't be shy insert your comments, insert your questions into the question section of your control panel. Now, just to make sure everybody can hear me, um, this is kind of a test for the sound system. If you'd be so kind as to click on the hand button in your control panel, that will allow me to know that you can hear me. Thank you for those that have clicked on it. Please re-click it, and we can then begin today's session. For those of you that have not joined um, the previous webinars, uh, allow me to introduce you to Woodburn. Woodburn Accountants and Advisors is specialized in inbound investment into China and Hong Kong. We establish, manage, and administer companies in both jurisdictions to meet our clients' specific requirements, which can include anything from market entry, cross-border investment, tax optimization, corporate restructuring, all of these types of services, plus the mundane administration work that needs to be done for any company that is registered in either of those locations. Our clients are international companies focused on inbound Asia investments, um, and they range from companies um, that are startups to multinationals publicly listed. Everyone is looking to do something different, whether it's manufacturing in China, selling into China, sourcing from China, um, or even providing a range of services uh, within China. A little bit about myself. My name is Christina kohler Coluccia. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Um, I've been dealing with China since 2003 when I relocated to Shanghai. Um, and I've been helping foreign investors with not only their market entry, but also their expansion within the territory. Um, three key things I've learned uh, in my 16 years of doing business in China. Um, the first is really patience. I've learned to garner a great deal of patience in terms of my personal life, as well as my professional life in China. 
Um, it's very common for the Chinese to play off on Westerners' lack of patience, uh, particularly with the speed of the environment. So one thing I would highlight to everybody is be patient with everything that comes out, particularly, and I'll, you'll see this through today's presentation, particularly when regulations and legislations um, get produced. The second thing I've learned and again, this probably pertains to the sector that I'm in, is having an eye on detail. And this can be an eye on detail in terms of um, how I do my branding, um, from my legal perspective, from a finance perspective, from an HR perspective. Really make sure you look at things two to three times. Be detail-oriented in that regard. Um, and the last and final thing that I think is critical, although I could name hundreds of things that I've learned, is Every company I've encountered and every friend that I've met that's, that's been living in China for a certain, period of a certain period of time, we've all encountered obstacles along our China journey. And this can be obstacles in the form of uh, you know, things with our personal life, but also definitely within our professional life. Um, one thing I've noticed is you know, Westerners, we tend to always look for somebody to blame. And definitely when I started off in China, that's what I did. I always blamed the person sitting next to me in my office, blamed my staff, um, started blaming clients, started blaming the head office um, with the lack of communication, the lack of speed, everything that was occurring. And I finally came to realize that that was such a waste of time of my efforts because with the speed of pace that China's in, you have to make sure you find solutions. And I think that is truly the beauty of China, is that there's always a loophole. There's always a way of getting around the obstacle. And the key thing is making sure that you find that solution as quickly as possible uh, in order to then not lose momentum throughout your China journey. Now, as Manfred is our moderator, um, let me just unmute him. I will let Manfred uh, introduce himself and his company as well. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's webinar. Also, uh, from my side, <clears throat> just a few short words about myself as well as about the company I'm running. Um, quite similar to Christina, my, my China journey started in, in 2003, really. Um, and just one of the results of that is uh, to speak fluent Mandarin. Uh, but it's been an exciting journey. I completely agree with Christina in terms of uh, pace, in terms of uh, differences. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, exciting things involved when dealing with China. Um, and it's so often in life, you know, it really comes down to detail. So even though today's topic might be uh, a bit hard to digest, uh, I still uh, hope you're, you're staying tuned and uh, you're listening in to, to Christina. Um, apart from that, you know, um, I'm, I'm really passionate about finding the right people for the right situations. Um, so this is also the reason why I'm the head of the uh, executive search unit here at the uh, Steinkallen at China Search. Um, Christina, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, I don't have your company page. Oh, okay, my there's, there's not that one in there. So uh, just maybe to, to uh, let that out for a few minutes uh, and then Christina will move on with the topic. Essentially, what we do is we find the right people. Um, most of the time, we're talking about uh, either the top man, the CEO or the plant manager. Um, and obviously, that needs to be happening with precision and it needs to be happening fast. And this is kind of uh, what we what we tuned our processes and attitudes to. Um, and apart from that, you know, we are uh, accompanying quite a lot of uh, SMEs. Some of them are starting out their China journey with a Wufi or a joint venture. Um, and other multinational companies maybe that have been there for 10 or 20 years. Um, so what we do apart from doing the executive search really is also to help you get uh, other people that you need in the team as a second business unit. Um, but I think without further ado, Christina's got quite a lot of uh, things to say today. So uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Manfred. Let's get started. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be talking about the individual income tax um, reform that's been occurring. Um, as Manfred highlighted, I've got two pages on my agenda um, to just highlight how much has actually been occurring in the Chinese market. And I think it's really important to look firstly at the general overview of what's happening in the Chinese market in general. Um, there are tax cuts occurring in all aspects of the corporate world. The 
Chinese government has basically said that their aim is to incur a tax cut of about 200 billion RMB for small and medium sized enterprises in order to boost employment and stabilize the economy. There was a meeting on the 9th of January 2019 where Premier Li Keqiang said, you know, we want to have these various tax cuts uh, in order to promote and boost and, and show that we care for the small and medium enterprises that exist in China. Now, just to give you a, a tad bit of statistics, you know, this accounts for 95% of the corporate taxpayers. Um, it accounts for 98% of all private businesses, um, which are generally family-owned businesses. It takes into account companies that are foreign invested as well. Um, there are certain guidelines and criteria that these SMEs have to fulfill in order to take advantage of these tax cuts, like, for example, um, having assets under 50 million RMB, having fewer than 300 employees, having a tax taxable income of less than 3 million RMB, and obviously being in industries and sectors that are non-prohibited or non-restricted. And these all these policies will all apply or have started to be applied as of January 1st and will continue for a period of three years until December 31st, 2021. Now, I just created here a, a table to highlight, and again, this doesn't really show the ins and outs and the formulas and the calculations, but it kind of gives you an idea. Um, basically, a company, whether foreign invested or local, if they have an annual taxable, uh, taxable income of less than a million RMB, um, they will have an effective tax rate of 5% now. Now, the formula is a bit more complicated because basically it goes saying that, you know, 20%, uh, there's a 20% tax rate on 25% of the income and the remaining 75% is free of charge. So, I mean, there are formulas and things that you have to take into account that arise behind these numbers, um, but it just shows you also then from uh, 1 million to 3 million, um, you have 5% on the first million and then 10% on the second million. So it's incredible. I just want to highlight this. It is incredible. Where the standard rate was 25% before, right, regardless of annual taxable income, it's incredible that the Chinese government is offering this to people, okay? In addition to that, there are also changes within the value-added tax. So I've just basically, for those of you that are not familiar with VAT in China, um, I, I, again, I tried to, to highlight this in two short slides. Um, the general taxpayer, you're, seven, you're liable for 17% tax on goods and services. Small-scale taxpayers, previously, meaning prior to Jan 1, you will be able um, to apply for a 3% VAT, which actually did not become liable if your quarterly revenue level was 90,000 RMB or less. Now, okay, the only thing I've changed here is the item in red is if you have a quarterly revenue level of 300,000 or less, you also have no VAT implication. So be very smart when you're setting up your companies, whether it's wise to be a small-scale taxpayer or a general VAT taxpayer. Um, definitely speak to an advisor uh, about that. Now, in addition to all of that, so you've got profits tax, you've got VAT. In addition to that, although it hasn't been enforced yet or implemented yet, the central government is looking to make further reductions in resource taxes, urban and construction taxes, stamp duty, local education surcharges, etc. And this will all come about within the year of 2019. Now, this leads me to the topic for today, which is the individual income tax reform. And when this came out, I think people's perspective was, oh my God, we're all going to have to pay more tax. Now that you've seen what's been happening on the general market on a corporate level, that's certainly not the outcome. All right, for individual income tax reform, people that are um, low to mid-income earners will actually be paying much less tax in China. 
Um, and the whole point of today's presentation is to go through that and to also then show you certain examples. Um, just to highlight here timelines, uh, the new tax brackets and standard deduction amounts came into effect October 1st, 18, while all the other um, personal income tax regulations came into force as of January 1st, 2019. So let's look at it. And, and I've made this as simple as possible for people to understand. Um, and if you do have questions, again, insert them into the question section of the control panel. Basically, in terms of tax thresholds, what's changed? Taxable income is now calculated on an annual basis versus what it was before, which was a monthly basis. This is fantastic because we're now getting onto a global scene where almost every other jurisdiction also looks at taxable income on an annual basis. All right. In addition to that, it's taking into account everything that you would earn in terms of income, salaries, wages, labor income, see I've used three different terms for that, remuneration, royalty income, rental income if you own properties, dividends, everything comes into that annual income category. Another aspect, and this will become more clear to you when I show you the formulas, um, previously foreigners would receive a um, automatic deduction from their gross salary of 4,800 renminbi. Local employees would receive a deduction of 3,500. Now it's been unified, which is a dream come true for most accountants and HR professionals, uh, primarily because there are now also no differences between foreigners and locals. It's become unified. And if you look at it from a monthly perspective, there is a automatic deduction of 5,000 renminbi but we all have to now switch our mind frames to an annual basis. So it's an annual deduction of 60,000 renminbi based on the annual salary. Now, like I said, everyone's going to receive this presentation. So I have listed here two tables, one which shows you the brackets for the annual income and one which shows you, because most people's minds are still in the monthly, um, monthly income. And you know, we'll, we'll, you can look at that in more detail and how that reflects to you personally or reflects to your staff personally at a later stage. But what do these new tax brackets mean? And ultimately, who does that affect? Right? So the adjustment of the tax brackets will mainly lead to a tax relief for individuals with low and medium income. Basically, and let me go back to the, the table, uh, this is the monthly income table, it's people in the ranges of 3, 10, and 20%, okay, where it's been expanded, okay. While the 25% tax rate bracket, this has been narrowed, all right. Anybody who's earning more, nothing changes. Everything remains the same. You don't have benefits, but you also don't have disadvantages. Nothing changes for you. So truly, this is impacting the low to mid income earners in China in order to help them um, save their taxes. And one thing I truly want to highlight is that we're switching, obviously, and this is something, again, you've got to get in your minds, we're switching from a monthly calculation to an annual calculation. Now, special deductions have always been provided. Special deductions will continue to be provided. And it will be provided not only for foreigners, but also for local employees. And this is for the support. The, the items in red are the new ones that have come about. Um, the items in black are already the existing ones that existed before, but only for foreigners. So the support for the elderly, as we all know, uh, if you look at China's population, it's it's very heavy on the on the uh, on the older uh, generations, and so obviously there has to be support provided to parents and grandparents, and this is deductible from your income. Expenses for further self-education, whether that's language training, whether that's going back to school, this can also be deducted. Education for children has always been there, but now it's also applied to the locals. Health care costs for serious illness is being provided. Housing loan interest, 
housing rent was always there, and now also charitable causes has been added. So for those of you that are on this um, webinar who are foreigners, you're probably going through your mind, well, do I still need to calculate and collect FAPIAOs every month? I've been collecting FAPIAOs for transportation, meals, laundry, you know, there's relocation, family visits, etc., that have been able to be deducted before. Now, this is not clear. Um, and again, this just shows you how China works. Um, we're still waiting for clarification from the various tax bureaus. So far, it's still working, but it could very well be that this changes um, in the short term. Um, if you're able to get away with it, fantastic, um, but just be prepared that you may not have to collect fob cows anymore, all right, um, because other things can be added in um, that, that are actually higher sums. Uh, just remember one thing, uh, and this is a tip, when you formulate your employment contract in China, make sure that allowances are clearly stated within the employment contract because these do need to be approved by the tax authorities uh, prior to the start of employment of any employee. Okay, um, For all those that are on continuing contracts right now, this is probably why you're not getting caught out by, this, um, uh, by these traditional tax exemption benefits. Um, for those of you that are planning on relocating or being seconded over there, definitely add these items in and see if you can get away with it, basically, until the formal amendments come into place. So, so far, everything is pretty amazing, all right? And, and this is where, you know, I, I have been talking to people who are so anxious by the situation, um, and obviously these are generally people who are in the higher tax brackets, nothing is changing for them, nothing. So, you know, you don't have to worry as much as you think you have to in terms of the individual income tax reform. One area which is definitely going to specifically impact foreigners um, is the fact that there is a new definition of what a resident individual is in China. So a resident individual is basically somebody who is um, domiciled or is residing in China uh, previously, it had to be for a year or more. Now they've reduced that time frame to 183 days or more in a tax year. A tax year in China is from January to December. It follows the calendar year. So basically, anybody who is spending more than 183 days in China in a calendar year will be liable to pay income tax regardless of where their salaries are paid to. Non-resident basically means a person who is not residing or domiciled in China for less than 183 days. But let's focus on these resident individuals because I do know a lot of people that are traveling to China on business and are spending a considerable amount of time there. And basically with the rule previously being up to a, a year or more, you now we really have to start calculating the days within a calendar year. So basically, for those individuals that are, well, basically don't have a work permit in China, but are traveling in and out of the country, the first thing you have to be aware of is that um, your income tax, first of all, you are liable if you spend a, more than 183 days. Uh, on your worldwide income. In addition to that, you've got to think of your salary as an annual package versus thinking of it as a monthly package. And remember all of those items that are included under the annual package, it's not just gross salary, it's everything else also that falls under it, including bonuses. And what's important is that at least for the next year, um, a withholding agent, and this can be your payroll department, your accounting department, your outsource provider, um, will withhold the tax amount uh, as, a, as a security to make sure that individuals can pay their taxes between January and March of next year. Okay? So uh, it's not that... Uh, 
uh, the government is saying, right, we're looking at it on an annual basis and you should take your responsibility to make sure you have enough money at the end of the year. No, 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 no. Uh, the Chinese government in the implementation process has said withholding agents will be responsible for withholding the tax amount um, and will then pay those taxes at the end of the year. And this will occur also for those individuals that are kind of in between and spending uh, you know, more than 183 days but are not permanently residing in China. So the big questions that arise, the first is, does the five-year residen residency rule still apply to foreigners? If For those of you that are not aware, basically you could avoid paying uh, income tax on your worldwide income uh, if you broke your tax residency by staying in your sixth year out of China for a period of 90 days or 30 consecutive days. Um, so the issue is the following. Um, according to Article 1 of the new law, it basically deems that a foreign individual who resides in China and has accumulated 183 days in the calendar year is considered as a tax resident and is therefore subjected to Chinese tax on their worldwide income. So this is now a disadvantage for foreigners and this is probably where the biggest disappointment will arise for foreigners and where companies will need to renegotiate contracts, salary packages and ultimately um, income tax obligations. Uh, so not this is definitely not a positive for foreigners. But there's also a lot of other questions that arise from the law. Like, for example, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about this. If someone is not permanently residing in China, how will China collect the individual income tax from that non-domiciled expat or foreigner? Um, you know, maybe this company is representing a firm that doesn't have an entity in China yet. So how are they going to collect it? My belief is that at some point there will be a very tight connection between immigration and the Chinese Tax Bureau. And when that point arises, anybody who is arriving at immigration and has been there for a period of longer than 100 or has, a, you know, is, has accumulated 183 days or more will be red flagged as having paid no taxes. I'm sure there will be a syn synchronization which occurs. Be aware of this. Another aspect that people need to think about is, you know, how will people, um, if they have to suddenly earn more income in China and declare everything, how will they be able to take that money out of China? Now, in theory and by law, if you've paid all of your individual income tax and you show these tax receipts to the bank, you should be able to repatriate as much funds as you actually like. The actual experience on the ground is it really comes down to the bank having enough forex to convert your your funds um, and allowing you then to send a um, high amount abroad. It is wise if people are going to be repatriating funds abroad, do it more often, like monthly, versus doing it in a lump sum at the end of the year. Now, it is expected that you know, further amendments and clarifications will come about, and I also truly believe that every tax bureau will have their own implementation policies. So definitely look into this. Um, but basically, the outcome uh, is that for foreigners, definitely have to relook at things. Now, the next question that's going to be coming up is whether the annual individual income tax declaration will still be required in the future. For the calendar year of 2018, it is still required that the annual income tax declarations be declared by March uh, 31st of 2019. The question is whether you'll have to do it in 2020. And the answer, according to the regulations, is no, because you are, first of all, declaring your income anyhow on an annual basis. Um, and ultimately, the tax payments will be required to be paid um, here I've written March and June. There are some other sources which have said also January and March. You need to specify this with the tax bureau uh, where your company is registered at to make sure uh, what the actual process is. But ultimately, the annual income tax declaration 
uh, will become obsolete at the end of, of this uh, period. Another thing that comes in that I think ties in very nicely with the five-year residency rule is the fact that the tax authorities are becoming stronger and more knowledgeable about anti-tax avoidance, um, basically tax evasion. Now, generally, what a lot of foreigners have done in China is that they have structured their packages into two separate contracts, one which is still with the headquarters and one which is China. And the issue between these contracts is the fact that the person is doing no work for the headquarter. So ultimately, that contract is fake. And what you're doing is you're splitting your salary in order to make sure you don't pay such high taxes in China. Now, if it comes about that the tax authorities find out that you've been having a dual contract and they see the responsibilities that are listed in the contract that is with the headquarter and find out, first of all, you're barely traveling there. Um, you're based in China, so the work must be under the China contract. Uh, you know, questions will start arising. If you want to do a dual contract arrangement, make sure that the one with the headquarter is true and authentic, that the responsibilities listed in there are real, which means you may need that these foreigners travel more and more often to the headquarter to fulfill those responsibilities, okay, and to then match the salary that is then being provided to them. Ultimately, what can we garner from this? the fact that the tax authorities in China are following OECD regulations in that the world is becoming more tax transparent. Taxes have to be paid somewhere. And the issue now is that with these new regulations, it is making it difficult for foreigners to structure employment contracts um, where you can minimize or, to put it another way, avoid taxes. Okay. So the question then arises, how to calculate your taxes in China? Um, I'm just going to go back to this table very quickly, again, from a monthly perspective, because most people's minds are in the monthly. You have to look at the third column, which is your gross monthly taxable income. You're going to look at deducting the 5,000 renminbi automatic deduction. You're going to look at deducting the special deductions, whether that's housing allowance, a support for education, and then you're going to look at the final amount, look inside the table, and see under which grade you fall under. Okay, so let's look at a real, real life example. I took a very normal amount, uh, sorry, let me go back, apologies. I took the amount of 19,000 as a gross salary per month with an estimation and assumption of a special deduction of 3,600, okay? So here it's to highlight 19,000 minus the 3,600 minus the 5,000, which is the automatic deduction, leads you to 10,400. If you look at the table, you're going to fall under the bracket of 10%. You then get also um, uh, another automatic deduction of 210 which leads to a tax liability of 830 renminbi, okay? Your net salary at the end of the day is 18,170. It's not complicated to create these types of formulas. It's a very straight formula. The explanation of the formula is listed on this slide. Um, and if you do need help, you know, don't hesitate to reach out and, and ask. So what are the key considerations for the IIT reform? Well, obviously, the first one that everyone needs to look at is their individual residency criteria. First of all, um, are they going to be residing in China that they will then need a work permit? Are they going to be in traveling to China for 183 days or less? This all needs to be clarified from day one. So for those of you that don't have a structure in China, but you are sending individual, individuals over to fulfill projects or to travel just on simple business trips, make sure you calculate their number of days that they don't fall over the 183-day um, limit. 
look at the new individual income tax categories, look at the lower tax brackets, um, and, and, and understand the formulas that are associated with calculating your income tax. Look at the standard deductions, look at the additional deductions that have been added in, and for now, assume that all the tax benefits uh, or, or the deductions that foreigners used to get still applies until amendments are actually uh, pushed through. Look at the scheduled taxation system. Um, look at how payments are going to be withheld. Um, look at when payments have to be paid. Think about any other source of income you're going to be earning besides your standard uh, gross salary, whether that's a bonus, commission, um, rental income, royalties, uh, dividends, etc. Think very carefully about anti-tax avoidance rules. If you have employees or you yourself are an employee with a dual contract, you're going to have to think about that again um, and make sure that you have a true and authentic agreement with your headquarter or the sister company or whomever um, that you don't fall into these issues. And I mean, keep in mind, uh, resources are limited at the tax bureau, so who are people going to focus on? It's probably the mid to high level income uh, individuals. Remember that the payment is now annual versus monthly and that payments should be withheld. This is truly critical and this is definitely something that companies need to reflect on that they have to withhold um, the, the tax amount. So what do you as a company need to do from an operational perspective? So basically, you know, we're at end of February. Um, Hopefully for January and February, or February's payments will be dealt in March. Hopefully for January, you've already done this. Um, if not, I'm sure your tax officers advised you on it. Um, but make sure that you have full information about what income your employees are earning, whether they are local or whether they are foreign. Um, remember to think about time frames. You may have to have now new internal processes. You may have to have a new system for receipt collection and verification based on the amendments. Um, remember about storage of not only the income tax, but also documentation, because I'm sure that come the time of filing the taxes next year, the tax authorities, the tax officers will be asking for evidentiary proof of the transactions of those individuals. So make sure you have a proper filing system in place. If you've already had a very good filing system, if you've been also checking your employees' fa piaos, um, and making sure that they're real fa piaos and not just fake ones, if you've already had a system in place that's covered all of this, then you'll actually be fine. If you didn't have a system like this, you should definitely think about creating one because to do all that work at the end of the year, plus doing your corporate audit work is going to be tedious and quite heavy. So, you know, I'll sum up everything at the end, but before I start on social insurance, I just want to say that the individual income tax reform is not necessarily a bad thing. I know it looks that way in terms of foreigners who are longer term based in China, um, but if you think about the normal expatriate package of a foreigner, they're usually not in China for more than three to five years. Okay, and then it's kind of rotating. Um, obviously, there are some individuals that have been in China for over 20 years, and this impacts them considerably uh, because they've been able to break their tax residency, and now they cannot. Um, I just want to emphasize again, tax needs to be paid somewhere. The whole concept of tax evasion it's going away from a corporate world and it's also going away from an individual income tax perspective. So tax needs to be paid somewhere. The idea is how to optimize it in an appropriate way with true and authentic agreements that you also don't then get in trouble with your head office. The next topic is social insurance in China. And there's not really much that I can say here except one change that occurred in April um, uh, that sorry that has occurred as of January 1st 2019 basically 
um, already at the end of second of the second half of 2018, the social insurance bureaus gave the tax bureaus um, the job and the responsibility to collect social insurance fees. But the issue that came about was that the tax bureaus were not actually checking anything because they'd never done it before. They weren't checking um, whether the amounts were correct. They weren't checking that actual payment was done. There was no formal system that had been created to clarify um, that things were done properly. Under the new rule, the tax bureau will have much more responsibility uh, in terms of collection of social insurance as well as checking that the contribution rates uh, are correct, have been calculated correctly, and that the payment matches uh, the social insurance rates. So the tax bureau will be much, much more um, proactive in these things. So I just want to highlight some tips that you have to make and, and I want to highlight first of all a case study which I mentioned in, in day one of the webinar series. I had one client who did not have a structure in China, uh, outsourced the employment of five individuals to a supplier, and the outcome upon a visit to China was that uh, the supplier was not paying the social insurance at all to the social insurance bureau. There was a staff member of his that was on crutches, had a broken leg, He'd broken it during um, company hours, and he was passing around an envelope asking for contributions to pay for his surgery and his medical bills. Um, for those of you that are sitting in Europe, you would complain and you would argue with your company if you were not receiving your social insurance benefits. Be fair with your empo employees. Social insurance is mandatory, it is owed to the people, and it is fair that it be paid to the people. So make sure that you actually do this appropriately. And this is also why the tax bureau is taking on the role, because um, the labor bureau just couldn't develop the resources and the quantity of staff to do these checks to make sure that people were being paid properly and that the calculations were proper. It is just a pure fact of humanity. Be fair with your employees. Keep also in mind that social insurance is owed not only to local individuals but also foreigners in China. Shanghai currently is the only exception where social insurance doesn't have to be paid for foreigners. With these changes that are occurring, I would not be surprised if that regulation changes in Shanghai at some point as well. So here are just a couple of tips that I think people should watch out for. One is be careful with your calculations, right? The tax bureaus do now have the capability to spot short payments. So make sure you're calculating the, the right social insur insurance contributions um, with the staff. Make sure that contributions are being owed also for dispatched employees or low-cost workers. Um, there will be information passed on to the tax bureau regarding the personal data of all the employees that are hired by the company, um, together with the individual income tax information. So they will know everything. So make sure you're also doing that um, properly. Uh, this is followed by the fact that uh, social insurance should technically be paid where the company is registered uh, and where the employee is residing. If you now have an employee that is hired by your Shanghai company who is based in Ningbo, um, this is not 100% legal and it could very well be that you are then forced to set up a branch company in Ningbo um, to, employ, um, uh, to employ this um, individual proper, properly so that the local Ningbo tax bureau then pays the social insurance, etc. So, Please be wary of that. Uh, one key aspect there is if you are a representative office and you are currently, you are required to use a dispatch agent um, to hire your local employees, check with your dispatch agent if they will help you in terms of doing the social insurance in another city. If you are a company um, and you're also using a limited company and you're also using a dispatch agent, in theory they will refuse that service, but there's no harm in just asking how it should work. 
be proactive in asking your providers questions, all right? Because um, you want to make sure that you are compliant and that you remain compliant in China. Um, if you are not treating social insurance seriously and you are not paying the right amounts, it can affect business. Um, worst case scenario, what the tax bureau can do is go to your office in the middle of the night, put a padlock key on your door so you can't enter in the next day, uh, which means you won't have access to computers, files, telephone systems, etc. So be weary of how seriously the tax bureaus are taking this now. Last but not least, penalties will become more severe. Um, it hasn't been defined what penalties will be, but first of all, I think penalties will now be imposed. It won't just be a slap on the hand, and two, the penalty amounts will be higher if there are any irregularities that are occurring, like non-payment, non-compliance, uh, miscalculations, etc. So please be aware of that. Um, last but not least, uh, November 2nd, 2018, the State Council did announce that they were looking at lowering social insurance contributions. This hasn't come into fruition. Um, it has also been said that if it doesn't come into fruition by end of April 2019, you know, nothing would occur, but actually now they've extended that timeline. They haven't given a specific date uh, to the extension, but ultimately I think it's very clear with this presentation today that not only from a corporate perspective in terms of corporate tax, individual tax, um, on social insurance, the government is aware that it is expensive, that it accounts for a tremendous amount of a person's salary package. So I think they truly are looking at how they can reduce that social insurance burden, um, again, in order to boost employment um, and, and help SMEs in China prosper, uh, prosper more. And I think ultimately they're also trying to reduce it because they know that people aren't paying it because of how expensive it is. Um, so they know if they can reduce it to a reasonable amount, um, then, you know, people will be more likely to just say, accept the fact and then just pay for it. So that's social insurance. Um, I'm going to speed up uh, so we have time for the Q&A. The last topic is visas, and these are all the visas that exist in China. Um, for today's purposes, I'm only talking about work visas and the changes that have occurred in that system. And I'm going to run through this relatively quickly. Again, you can read the content um, later. Basically, with work permits, which are Z visas for foreigners, they've combined the uh, alien employment permit and the foreign export permit into one single work permit, um, which is basically simplifying the system. However, what is now making it more complex is that they've introduced a three-tier talent grading system for foreigners which is really um, extremely confusing and, quite frankly, does not seem to be systematic. Basically, what they're saying is, is that the Tier A comprises of the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant foreigners that exist in China, which is 16% of the foreigners. Um, they get certain benefits in terms of green channel service. Um, their applications go by much smoother, much faster. You then have the Tier Bs, which is about 61% of the foreigners. Um, and the key aspect here is that they must have a bachelor's degree and at least two years of valid working experience within their field in order to um, be within the tier, tier B category. All original documents need to be provided for. They need to be true and authentic. And I think one thing to highlight here is that the foreigners are controlled based on the labor market demand which basically means, and this occurs within every single jurisdiction around the world, the Chinese government wants you to hire Chinese people. It's truly as simple as that. They want you to hire Chinese people. They want you to hire the locals in order to boost employment and boost the, economic, the, 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 the local economic the, you know, structure of the, of the country. They don't want you to just hire foreigners and run your company with just foreigners. Um, how does this help them? 
right? This only helps the foreigners in terms of coming to a new country, relocating, experiencing something new, but it doesn't actually help the local environment. So as you can imagine, they are going to make it a little bit difficult for you, right? They're going to ask questions like, why do you need a foreigner for this role? Why do you need a foreigner for this position? Especially if it's mid-tier positions, all right? Senior level management positions, you know, we get it. We understand why. You want to have a foreigner at the top of the, of the umbrella to manage everything. But why do you need then foreigners on the tier two level or the tier three level? Okay, why can't you hire a Chinese person to do that job? You need to give explanations for that. Um, I remember uh, with my old firm, one of the, the questions that arose with us, because we did have foreigners on staff, and one of the reasons that I gave was primarily the fact that my foreign staff spoke local languages that catered to our clientele. And as a consequence, uh, we needed them on staff in order to aid in the communication, whether it was to speak in German, speak in French, speak in Spanish, etc. cetera. Um, and this helped in the application process, but it did take a much longer time uh, than I thought was necessary uh, to get it approved. The tier C is, again, about 22% of the foreigners, and they're basically, it's for individuals that aren't planning to spend a long period of time um, in China. Uh, so one of the things that falls under this category, and this is the only one that exists so far, is the China-France intern program, um, uh, which exists. It doesn't exist with any other country. So uh, again, you can see it's, it's not for, for people that are there for a long period of time or don't have longer contracts. Things that you shouldn't be worried about. First of all, those people that are already in China and have work permits, they should have no reason to worry. Their work permits will be converted into Tier B statuses. Um, most mid-level or to senior managers, technical staff should be clear as well. Um, as long as they have, you know, they'll fall under the Tier B status um, as well. So this is mid-level to senior managers or technical staff. There will be exceptions, though. Um, you know, Shanghai definitely has a quota on the amount of foreigners. Um, people with very experienced qualifications in science, engineering, math, tech, um, they should face no problems. Lack of Mandarin shouldn't be a problem either. Obviously, if you're going out west, um, you know, there's hardly any foreigners that are out there. I don't want to say hardly, but compared to Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, there are much fewer foreigners. So there, again, it's likely to su succeed. Um, people who've had extremely high educations, master's degrees, you know, beyond the bachelor degree, they will probably have more chances of, of getting approved. Where the problems lie is basically with cheap employment. It's the fresh graduates, it's the entry-level positions, it's the interns. And this is where people get frustrated because you can't prove the two-year job experience requirement. Now, if you're located in a free trade zone, there have been signs that visas will get approved, but again, absolutely no guarantee. So you really do only want to search for people, if they are foreigners, that have two years or more of experience. Um, if they're already in China and you're recruiting them from there, it shouldn't be a problem because they should already have their work permits and it would just be converted from one company to another. So um, last slide, conclusion. Basically, China is lowering the tax liabilities for companies as well as individuals. It's replicating global tax systems which I know everyone is trying to avoid and evade, it's becoming impossible to do that now. Taxes have to be paid somewhere. Social insurance is applicable to all foreigners and local individuals, exemptions provided in Shanghai for the time being. Uh, tax bureaus are going to be in charge of collecting the social insurance amounts, um, and deductions may be offered in the future, so definitely watch out for that. The one thing that I think people should really be concerned by, and I see it in Shanghai, I do see fewer foreigners walking around in the streets. I see fewer of, uh, fewer uh, foreigners even event at events that I'm speaking at. Um, it is a big concern that visas are not going to be approved. 
I know a lot of people also that own their own businesses in China, have been in China for 20, 25 years, and currently they're hitting the um, retirement ages and not getting their visas approved, which means they have to shut down their businesses. I mean, it, the work permit issue is really not a joke. Um, Definitely, if it becomes a big concern for people that are in higher level positions, definitely talk to very qualified and experienced immigration lawyers to help you through those work permit applications. Okay, I think I sped through that. Um, let's start off with the Q&A. Manfred? Well done, Christina. Well done. Uh, as you said, not an easy topic. Hope there's still a, a few couple out there not, not asleep. Um, having gone through the coffee. Um, I've got a couple of questions rolling in. We still got about five-ish minutes left, so I'll uh, I'll just kick off. Um, got one question here that says, uh, it is hard to digest all the information. I completely agree with that part. Um, in short, does it mean that foreigners and locals have a lower tax liability than previously? Um, that depends. So basically, if you look at the tax brackets table, um, there are seven categories. The first three categories definitely do have lower tax liabilities. So basically, anybody earning 25,000 renminbi or less will be will have a much lower tax liability. Um, then you know, 25,000 to 40,000, you're at the stage where um, uh, it's it's yes, you're earning pretty much the same, if not slightly lower. In the top three categories, you're earning identical. No change whatsoever in terms of your tax liabilities. All right. That's good for those of us who are earning a bit more. Um, <laughs> leading, leading on to a salary question, um, what is the general rule for salary increases? Um, so this, uh, this question actually popped up recently. Um, so in the past, the general rule was that if somebody worked with you, and this is not for foreigners, because when, you, when you're when uh, you working with foreign employees, most of the time their contracts are negotiated with the headquarter versus with the local entity. But when you're talking with local employees, what you will find is that the general trend is um, a kind of standard 10% increase is given after the first year. Obviously, it has to be based on performance, it has to be based on company performance, but that's the general trend. After that first year, however, um, companies generally follow inflation guidelines. Um, and and so, you know, you're looking at anything from around uh, 5 to 8 percent, um, depending on the city uh, and, and depending on, on the region that you're in. Okay, so you're saying 10% in the first year and then inflation based is in 5 to 10%. Yes, yes, but you know, inflation is also going down. So um, people aren't so happy with that fact because it just means they get less, less increases. Mm -hmm. Harder to increase your status and gain face. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've got another, we've got another couple of minutes left. Um, I've got another maybe a trickier or well, not so tricky one here. Uh, what are the social insurance rates we're incorporating in Shanghai? What would we need to calculate in? So that's a so that's something I didn't touch on just because of time permitting. Um, basically, in Shanghai, when you're looking at social insurance rates, you're looking at a total. Um, okay, it's a bit complicated to to uh, discuss, but there's a cap. Currently, the cap I believe is at around uh, twelve thousand renminbi. If you earn 12,000 renminbi or less, then the social insurance amount will be about 61% of your salary, of the gross salary. And it's divided into a portion paid by the company and a portion paid by uh, the employee. Uh, it's approximately 45% paid by the uh, uh, company. When you mm -hmm. have a salary that's over this 12,000, it's capped at the 12,000 level. So anyone earning more than 12,000, you have to look at the 12,000 level and that's the amount that has to then be distributed. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's not peanuts when you look at things. And Shanghai actually has the highest standard of living, hence it has the highest social insurance rates um, compared to any other city in, in China. Um, but it truly does impact your budgeting. So 
definitely think about how social insurance be, you know, should be should be calculated and, and covered. So, so if somebody out there is is setting up something new, um, where where would they really go to? Where would they turn to in order to figure out those different rates? Um, so you can go to any payroll agent. There are a lot of state-owned companies like Fesco, uh, CIIC, um, Asia Pacific HR. I mean, there there are a lot, a lot of companies out there that can do the work for you. Um, Would we can you also, also suggest them coming to you? We can we can also do the the breakdown for you as well. Um, we also offer those payroll payroll types of services. Okay. Okay. Um, and maybe just one last uh, question here that probably sums up your last slides is why are work permits becoming so difficult to obtain? Um, I think, you know, the, the work permits are becoming difficult to, to obtain primarily from the fact that the Chinese want you to hire Chinese people. Um, I think it's been quite lenient in the past in terms of how work permits were provided, you know, work. I remember in 2003, it literally took me 10 days to get work permit and residence visa. And I could do it all while I was in China. And then over years, it got a little bit trickier. This whole Z visa concept came about where you could only obtain that abroad, um, then fly back in. Uh, and over the years, you've seen it getting more and more tricky. But I think ultimately what's coming about is the fact that the, the Chinese government wants you to hire Chinese people. So they really want to understand why you're hiring these foreigners. Um, what do you need them for? Why are they valuable to your company? And if you can somehow show that by having this person, it will boost their profitability, so they might pay more tax, or it will boost then other forms of employment. Um, then that, that's great. Then then you know you might have a greater chance of getting this person on board. All right. Thank you so much, Christina, for uh, answering all the questions. Um, I think we're pretty much on time. Um, shall we leave it at this? Yes, uh, definitely, because we we are running out. Um, I think there are more questions that were asked. I will yes, answer are. you um, at a later stage. Don't worry, I will be answering you. Uh, just, just be patient. Um, I would like to just thank everyone for their time. Um, I, I've seen some people joining for all four sessions. Well done, you. Um, thank you all for, for joining in, listening in. Um, uh, again, all the recordings will be up on the YouTube channel and copies of the presentations will be provided to you. Um, Manfred, thank you also for your time for the last four days in presenting. It's been a pleasure. Uh, really appreciate it. And for those of you that are interested, um, please subscribe free of charge. We have uh, weekly e-campaigns that get sent out with new articles, new publications, um, new webinars. Uh, next Tuesday, I will also be sending out the webinar recordings to the list. So do join in. You can easily subscribe on our website um, or follow, follow me, follow the company on any one um, of these social media sites. Follow Manfred too. Um, there's a lot happening on his side as well. So if there's any chance, you know, just reach out to us. Uh, maybe uh, there's a chance to actually uh, have a personal talk or a video call or anything along those lines. We're there. We we're available. Um, and we're always happy to, uh, to discuss your issues. Exactly. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.